Hi class, Brother Costello here. I hope you are well. I hope uh, you're having fun at home and hope you're having a good evening. I'd like to go ahead and begin with our lesson today on approaching LDS doctrine in history. And uh, much of what I got today I have comes from uh, Brother Scott Woodward and uh, uh, Anthony Sweat and a few others. And so I hope this will be helpful to you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to play a hymn. And I'll have the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sing for us. And when they get done singing, if you would, just pause the video and then have an opening prayer. And then, and then listen and enjoy. So today, today's essential concepts are what are two common misconceptions about how to determine true doctrine? How is true doctrine to be determined? Why is being able to determine official doctrine an important spiritual survival kit skill today? How can we determine what reliable history is? Why is being able to determine reliable history an important survival skill? Have you ever wondered this question about this question? If God is unchanging and truth is eternal, then why have some of the teachings of the church changed over time? Why don't we teach some of the some of the doctrines that were taught in the early church? Were they wrong? Or are we today? For example, why was there plural marriage in the Old Testament but not in the New Testament? Um, or in the Book of Mormon? world. Why command it in the pioneer day, but not in our day? Or how about this? I once heard that Hiram Smith said that those in the terrestrial kingdom will either progress to celestial or recede to the celestial kingdom. Is that true doctrine? Or I heard Wilford Woodruff once say that Brigham Young said, Wilford Woodruff wrote in his journal that Brigham Young said that those who do not in initially inherit the celestial kingdom would, quote, eventually have a privilege of moving themselves worthy and advancing to celestial kingdom, but it would be a slow progress. So how can I differentiate between an opinion and an official doctrine of the church? So let's take an example. Okay, I'm going to throw this one at you. If this is official LDS doctrine, um, is it or why or why not? So we must take the sacrament with the right hand. How would you answer that? I want you to answer in your head. Okay. So, oh, Brother Castillo, you didn't answer it. Is this official LDS doctrine? We can progress from kingdom to kingdom in the next life. Telestial to terrestrial to celestial. Well, you heard Hiram Smith, who was second to the prophet Joseph Smith in the first presidency. 
And so, was that true? Well, Spencer W. Kimball, a later prophet, said, quote, after a person has been assigned to his place in the kingdom, either the celestial or terrestrial or celestial, or to his exaltation, he will never advance from his assigned glory to another glory. That is eternal. Boom. So, is this official LDS doctrine? Women should not have multiple ear piercings. They should only wear one pair of earrings. Where'd that doctrine even come from? That is it a policy, a doctrine, a principle? Actually, it came from uh, um, Gordon B. Hinckley. I was there, heard that talk. How about this one? Defining the word doctor. Oh, wait, this is another one, but I just want—I want to define it. It's something that is taught or teaching instruction. So, for example, um, when Jesus taught, said the people were astonished at the Savior's doctrine. For he taught them as one as having authority. And if you look at that word doctrine, in, uh, you look in a Greek lexicon, it's didache, meaning teaching or the act of teaching. So uh, that's pretty general definition of what doctrine is. And we see, so for example, let's, let's take a look. Uh, is this doctrine or not? So the rich young ruler comes to uh, Jesus and says, what should I do that I may have eternal life? And, uh, and that Jesus says to him, uh, do not commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And by the way, before he made that statement, Mark says, and Jesus beholding him, loved him. And then he said, don't commit adultery, dot, dot, dot. And then, oh, and then Jesus is like, oh, and there's one more thing. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor. So is that doctrine to sell all that you have, to take your savings and to give it to the Lord, to give it to the poor? For, for those of you that grew up in a wealthy family, is that wrong? If it is, it was wrong for Abraham because Abraham was very wealthy. Is that doctrine? Is it a policy, a principle? Is it a commandment directed to someone that needed it? And, you know, that interesting, that one scripture, that it, it would move the monks in the desert of Egypt to sell all they have and go and live. Uh, they would either go to the deserts of Egypt, they would go to the caves of Cappadocia in, in Turkey, the Augustinian monks, the Franciscans, they would sell and give all that they had. So it's important to know they looked at that and said it's doctrine. But I know you look at that and say, well, I think that was doctrine. That was a commandment for someone that needed, struggled with uh, selfishness. That President Harold B. Lee said, the most important of all the commandments is the one that requires the greatest soul searching to obey. That probably would fit the rich young ruler. But that doesn't mean it's a blanket statement to go sell all you have. It's not a blanket statement for everybody. But how do we know if that was doctrine for everybody or just for him? So, so what is doctrine today in the church? We know that it was a very general, broad term in Jesus' day. Um, in the, at the Mormon newsroom, it said some doctrines are more important than others and might be considered core doctrines. For example... The precise location of the Garden of Eden is far less important than the doctrine about Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. Um, President Uchtdorf said uh, he'll use, when, when some of the prophets and apostles will talk about doctrines, they'll use adjectives like core doctrines, essential doctrines, fundamental doctrines, applying that there are non-core doctrines and there are doctrines of hierarchy of what's doctrine and what's not. So uh, I want to share something with you that um, I've pulled from uh, uh, two people, Scott Woodward and uh, Anthony Sweat. I can't remember the other guy that wrote the article with Anthony, two other people. I apologize if, if whoever they are. But there's a couple of different doctrines. There's core doctrines. They're unchanging truths to salvation. Supportive doctrines. They elaborate, describe, they're timely. Uh, teachings expanding on the core doctrine. So let me say that they, they, they expand, they bolster, they augment the core doctrines. They're supportive. They have a, they're a supporting role. They get the Academy Award for the supporting actor or actress. Then there's the policies. They're timely statement, statements that relate to application 
of supportive or core doctrines. For example, it used to be um, policy doctrine was that uh, policy back in the Old Testament was that if you were, took a Nazarite vow, you had to let your hair grow long. You had to have it be really long. And now, today, if you go on a mission, you got to cut it short. Esoteric doctrine, unknown or partially revealed. And, we'll, and let me explain the, each one of these. So a core doctrine got their gospel doctrines that are eternal. They don't change. They pertain to the eternal progression and ex exaltation of Heavenly Father's uh, sons and daughters. So, for example, if you go to Doctrine and Covenants uh, 20, this is the church founding official title of DNC 20. <clears throat> it was uh, put together by our uh, and by Oliver Cowder and approved by the Prophet Joseph Smith. And there are very succinct uh, core doctrines in there. For example, there's a God in heaven. He's infinite, eternal. He created man and female, uh, male and female after his own image, gave unto them commandments. And by transgression of these holy laws, man became fallen. And it's through the first principles and ordinances that we are saved. So the, very, that's very core. Now here's a supportive doctrine. Christ's atonement is core, but how he suffered, what he suffered, served to expand upon the core of the atonement. So, thus, supporting doctrines, they can be eternal truths, but knowledge of them, unlike core doctrines, are not necessarily essential for salvation. So, for example, a righteous city, New Jerusalem, will be built, and Christ's people gathered to prepare for his return. Supportive doctrine, not core, not quintessential. There will be a great gathering in Adam on Diamond to prepare for Christ's millennial rule. Elder Bruce R. Maconkey said it would be the biggest sacrament meeting in the world the church has ever known. Is that important? Yeah, it's interesting because it's interesting. Is it, is it core? Nah, it's supportive. When Jesus nah, returns to the earth, uh, the Mount of Olives will split and the Jewish people will recognize the Lord. So uh, these supportive doctrines, uh, and that, by the way, that's, that's not core. Is it interesting? Absolutely. I love teaching about that. Zechariah chapter 12 in the Old Testament. These teachings may not be essential for salvation, but I think it's important that they elaborate, they expand our understanding, they increase our faith, and they, they, provide, um, they provide the how of the core doctrine. You know, how would Jesus return to the earth? Okay, so let's talk about policies. The, the, the way to remember policy, the essential, I think, important aspect of them is that they're timely and they, they apply core and supportive doctrine. They're backed by doctrine, but they're timely. That means that they can go away. For example, standards for dress and grooming. Just as I was telling you, a Nazarite couldn't eat grapes couldn't drink wine, couldn't eat grape leaves, couldn't eat raisins, had to grow his hair long, couldn't touch a dead animal. But today, that's not true. I can eat all the grapes I want. I can drink all the fruit juice I want. Wine. Uh, not, I mean, sorry, not wine. I, but I can drink grape juice, right? So, uh, yes. And uh, length, length of church uh, used to be three hours. Um, not drinking wine. There was a time in, in all the Old Testament and New Testament days in Book of Mormon, you could drink wine. Today, you can't. Priests, there was a time when priests couldn't baptize in the house of the Lord. Now they can. So, let's, um, as, as I mentioned, in Jesus' day, everybody drank wine. So why, why can't we as church members drink wine today? Uh, I, th I think the Word of Wisdom is a modern example of how policies change. Um, but it's not necessarily doctrine. So look at the red there. Restrictions on tea and coffee and wine have not been in effect all, in all dispensations of time. Yet, do you remember Joseph got the revelation, DNC 89, that says, because of the evil and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men in the last days, he provided a new doctrine for the benefit of the saints. I mean, Think of all that's been done with alcohol and energy drinks and all the things that people are consuming that are controlling their lives. They're these things that are creating habits for themselves and the addictions and the, and the deaths that come and the families that are destroyed because of alcohol. Satan truly has taken alcohol, alcohol 
and has just pummeled uh, people in the world. Well, then we get to that last part, the esoteric doctrines. And the word esoteric, it just means teachings that are they're really only understood by a, a small group of people. You could say obscure, they're obscure, they're ambiguous. For example, what's in the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon? Well, we could just have talks about that and we could speculate and we could even pull up interesting quotes from the Journal of Discourses. We could pull up quotes from uh, even apostles in the 40s and 50s, 60s, even maybe even today, comments people made or, or findings of scholars that say, hey, I, this could be you know, something that's in there. And, uh, but we don't know. We don't know. We just don't know. And so, uh, so we, I think you could say baptism is a core doctrine. Not, I think, I know. Uh, baptisms for the dead in our dispensation, that's a supportive doctrine. Probably not core because, it, well, it has, at least hasn't been in the sense that it's been taught in every single dispensation and has been practiced in every dispensation. So it probably goes up more towards core and our dispensation, definitely. So I don't know if that's the best example, but do baptisms for the dead in temples. There was a time people were doing them in the Mississippi River, and then the policy changed. The Lord said, I won't accept those no more. Go do them in the Nauvoo Temple. Um, and they, have to, they, had to be, they had to be gender specific. Uh, there was a time when I think, uh, oh gosh, I want to say, I can't remember her name. As soon as she heard Joseph Smith's uh, talk on baptism for the dead, she went right out to the Mississippi River and uh, uh, got baptized for her for a boy. Uh, esoteric doctrine. How are they accepted in the spirit world? Well, we don't know. We don't know. You hear, you'll hear stories. Uh, I remember I hear, heard a story from one of my friends who his great-grandfather, who was, uh, I want to say, a goobler down in St. George, had a story, a beautiful story, where, um, and Wolfer Woodruff has a story where, where people would, uh, that he was doing the temple work for, the baptisms for the dead, they, they actually appeared in the St. George Temple. Uh, and my friend, um, Brother Gubler, was telling me how they were, all these people were up on the back balcony, and his, it was either his grandfather, great grandfather, saw the people that were being baptized for, saw their spirits, and as soon as he got baptized for them, they, their people would kind of hug him and shake his hand, and then that person would disappear. Then he'd get baptized for another. Do you hear stories like that all the time? Um, is that uh, policy supportive? Court? No. Um, it's, it's esoteric. Yeah, we've got stories, but um, nothing's been revealed in the scriptures. And so, anyway, so we got to be careful. And, it, and by the way, it doesn't just have to be revealed in the scriptures, and, and uh, we'll talk more about that later. But let's start with what does not determine official doctrine. Now, some will say, well, it's only true doctrine if it's taught from the pulpit in general conference, and it, has, it matters where it's said. But can't a Sunday school teacher or an elders quorum teacher or a Relief Society preacher stand up, or maybe a person speaking at state conference or in a BYU-Idaho class, uh, a teacher speak by the power of the Holy Ghost and be moved upon by the Holy Ghost to speak the words of Christ? Isn't that truth? Is that doctrine? Well, absolutely. Now, if, if that person started claiming that it's the, every, this is doctrine for everybody, uh, but maybe if it's a doctrine taught by a prophet of God and he says this is something we should not commit adultery, then yeah, that's 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 a legit thing. But again, it doesn't just have to be to speak doctrine, you don't have to be at general conference. And there have been prophets and apostles, um, for, from, for example, the prophet Joseph Smith taught him and Orson Hyde, when him and Orson Hyde were visiting his sister in, outside of Nauvoo, he received a revelation in the kitchen while they were having a discussion. So, yeah, it's not necessarily where it's located, so that's not the biggest, most important thing. And it's not determined necessarily by the person's church calling. Um, people can quote and state true doctrine, whether they're a Relief Society president or they're a president prophet of the church. And so they don't necessarily have to be an apostle uh, if they're stating true doctrine from core doctrines that have been taught by prophets and apostles. But, but so if an apostle, some will say, well, if an apostle said it, then it's true, right? Um, but 
not necessarily. And, and a lot of things that we quote in Sunday school and sacrament meeting and say and teach as if it's doctrine were actually given by prophets and apostles before they were ever even called to be in, in the Quorum of the Twelve. For example, Articles of Faith by James E. Talmadge, Marvelous Work and Wonder uh, by LeGrand Richards, Mormon Doctrine by Bruce R. McConkie, Doctrinal New Testament Baptism. So, um, so were they, when they were wrote those books, um, or, and even after they became an apostle, you know, lots of apostles and prophets have written, you know, Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, you know, voluminous amounts of books and writings. So was he, in every single thing he said, was he teaching as an apostle or as a theologian? Maybe he was just um, making a comment applying a core doctrine and that's what theologians do and I think that's the difference between theology and doctrine is doctrines are doctrines they're they're core and they're things that the Lord has said this is my doctrine but then when we, but then sometimes people will make comments about that doctrine and that's where they're kind of delving into theology and they're discussing and commentating so again are, is he an apostle speaking as apostle or as a theologian for example, Elder Bruce Armakonki at one time said that that uh, he named a specific church, um, not a Protestant church, but another one, and he said that is the great and abominable church uh, that Nephi made reference to in First Nephi, and that got put in Mormon doctrine, and uh, to my knowledge, that's that's not been taught in conference. And in fact, it's been refuted historically by many scholars, uh, Stephen Robinson among many, who say there's no way, if you look at that historically, there's no way that that could even be possible. So, so we have to remember that not every statement, just because the person's an apostle, just because the person's a prophet, um, were they speaking as apostle or were they speaking as a prophet? Or as Brigham Young once said, I was just speaking as Brigham Young when I said that. And we'll talk more about that later. I love this quote by Elder D. Todd Christofferson. By this experience and revelation to Peter, the Lord modified the practice of the church and revealed a more complete doctrinal understanding to his disciples. And so the preaching of the gospel expanded to encompass all mankind. These same patterns are followed today in the restored Church of Jesus Christ. The president of the Church may announce or interpret doctrines based on revelation to him. Doctrinal exposition may also come through the combined council of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Council deliberations will often include a weighing of canonized scriptures, the teachings of Church leaders, and past practice. But in the end, just as in the New Testament Church, the objective is not simply consensus among council members, but revelation from God. It is a process involving both reason and faith for obtaining the mind and will of the Lord. At the same time, it should be remembered that not every statement made by a Church leader, past or present, necessarily constitutes doctrine. It is commonly understood in the Church that a statement made by one leader on a single occasion often represents a personal, though well-considered, opinion, not meant to be official or binding for the whole Church. The Prophet Joseph Smith taught that a prophet is a prophet only when he is acting as such. President Clark, quoted earlier, observed, To this point runs a simple story my father told me as a boy. I do not know on what authority, but it illustrates the point. His story was that during the excitement incident to the coming of Johnston's army, Brigham Young preached to the people in a morning meeting a sermon vibrant with defiance to the approaching army and declaring an intention to oppose and drive them back. In the afternoon meeting, he arose and said that Brigham Young had been speaking in the morning but that the Lord was going to talk now. <laughs> he then delivered an address, the tempo of which was the opposite from the morning talk. Quote, The Church will know by the testimony of the Holy Ghost in the body of the members 
whether the brethren in voicing their views are moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and in due time that knowledge will be made manifest." Unquote. Very powerful. Uh, Harold B. Lee would say the same. It's not to be thought that every word spoken by our leaders is inspired. So not only does it not constitute doctrine necessarily or is inspired, it's not to be thought that every word spoken by the general authorities is inspired. We have to remember, now you remember you read this quote, and it's powerful, men who wear the prophetic mantle, they're still men. They have their own views, and their understanding of gospel truths is dependent upon the study and inspiration that is theirs. So that's important. I just realized i got to turn something off real quick here. So um, so going on to, I want to hear, let you hear what Elder Oaks uh, said. It's a great talked. comfort to me to know that I don't have to take the statement or actions of one particular leader as expressive of the doctrine and expectations of the church. We don't believe in infallibility of our leaders. Again, he said, we don't believe in the infallibility of our leaders. We believe our leaders make mistakes. But Okay, so, but what if the leader is a prophet? Do, isn't it true if it's taught by the president of the church while he is a prophet of God? Now, this also sounds good on the surface, but upon investigation, we find that this is problematic as well. In fact, there are two major problems with this. Problem number one, if we limit official doctrine to those things spoken or written by the presidents of the church, then we must eliminate the following. We must eliminate Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John, unless John was called after the death of Peter, he was called to be because he was, became the senior apostle. We have to get rid of Acts. We have to get rid of the epistles of Paul, James, and Jude. Why do we have to do that? Because they were not presidents. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, not, he wasn't a president of the church. Paul wasn't a president. He was an apostle, and he said, I'm the least of the apostles. James, the actual brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James, who was Jesus' brother, went to family home evening with them, had dinner with them, that James, not Peter, James, and John. That's a different James. He also, we can't count his writings. So James 1.5, that's thrown out the window. We can't count Nephi because he was a he was, a, he was still a kid. Well, that, that probably didn't matter as much as it mattered that Lehi was still alive. And Lehi was the prophet seer and revelator. He was the prophet, and Nephi prophesied. So you can't count Enos or Abinadi, Samuel the Lamanite, Lamanite or Moroni, if, that is, if Mormon, his dad, was still alive because his father was the chief prophet, the head prophet. Now we can't count DNC 2 through 20 because that was received before the organize, organization of the church in April 1830. And that means that Joseph was writing as a non-member. So we can't count the first vision because it wasn't called to be a prof yet. It didn't have keys anyways. Can't count section 134. Oliver wrote that. And 135, John Taylor wrote it. So problem number two, there have been times when even the president of the church has not been moved upon the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Ghost. They may speak on occasions their own opinions. Now, as you know, Brigham Young has a time or two. He says, I have known many times I have preached wrong. For example, when Johnson's army was marching to, to uh, Utah territory to uh, um, take the Mormons and, uh, I'm not supposed to say Mormons, but that's what they called them back then. You get the idea. So, uh, Brigham Young finds out about it. And he says he stands up and gives this fiery brimstone uh, sermon in the morning at General Conference. How we won't stand for it. We'll fight. We'll fight. To the, we'll fight Johnson's army. And then later on that afternoon at General Conference, he stands up and he said, "So I'm just paraphrasing, but he said, brother, this morning you heard from Brigham Young. Now today you're going to hear what the Lord wants you to hear." And then he just changed his whole tune. So. Uh, he knew. He knew he was speaking his opinion, not the Lord's opinion. So it's very, very important that the only one authorized to bring forth any new doctrine is the president of the church, who, when he does, he will declare it's a revelation from God, it'll be accepted by the Council of the Twelve, and three, it'll be sustained by the body of the church. For example, when Wilford Woodruff, when he was uh, received the manifesto to... Uh, discontinue plural marriage in the church. 
he not only did he present it to the Quorum of the Twelve and have him sustain it, but then he stood up in conference and had everybody said, all those in favor, raise their hand, show by the raise of the right hand. So they sustained it as well. So if official doctrine is not determined by where it was said or who said it or what calling they held at the time it was said, well, what? Don't. So how do we know? Well, you remember in your reading, there were the three lens, the three lenses uh, for determining true doctrine. Do you remember what they were? The first one was that the truth needs to be taught in scripture repeatedly. It needs to be taught by prophets repeatedly, and it needs to be confirmed by the Holy Ghost. So that, those three lens brought together, that sweet spot in the middle, that's what creates the word of God. That's what creates the iron, iron rod that we can hold on to. So the iron rod is not just one thing, but it's three things woven together. So it, what if this became our doctrinal filter? With everything that we hear, everything that's being said um, by the critics of the church and by people that are falling away from the church, how do we know what's true and what's not true? Well, why is that important? And I, I think it's pretty obvious. So some question the truthfulness of the church when they find a statement made by maybe a, a past church leader that it's not in harmony with our doctrine. And, you know, quite frankly, prophets have given their opinion um, since the beginning of this dispensation. Uh, let me just give you one example. So, and you read about this one where Joseph Fielding Smith said, we will never get a man into space. He said, this earth is man's fear, and it was never intended that he should get away from it. Well, as you know, um, that changed, and the apostles, they did walk on the moon. And a reporter threw out to uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, he said, so how do you reconcile that, what you said about no man could ever walk on the moon? And he said, well, I was wrong, wasn't I? <laughs> he admitted it. He knew it. Well, Remember President Uchtdorf said, Latter-day Saints are not asked to blindly accept everything they hear. We don't, we're encouraged to think and discover truth for ourselves. And that's what, that's why this lesson is so important, because I feel like I'm giving you a lens uh, to look at truth and to uh, try to understand it. And I want to thank Brother Scott Woodward in our department who, who's taught this to me. So let's practice this a little bit. And I want you to think of this model in your head. Now, there are some things there that are taught, uh, some things we'll read about, uh, we'll hear about doctrines and principles in our church. And just think of this model right here, that some things you can have a real high level of confidence that that's true. And some things, nah, it's kind of in the middle and some things very low confidence. So, uh, so how confident are you that we need faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that it's essential for salvation? Well, that... You have high confidence in that, don't you? How about, um, how confident are you that God the Father is married? Well, I hope, I hope it's somewhere between, somewhere at least inching up towards high, because even though it's not in the scriptures, many apostles and prophets have taught uh, that doctrine. And in fact, in the um, uh proclamation on the family, it says, talks about um, our uh, heavenly parents. And so, yeah, so that one, you do, I think it goes right up there. How about Jesus was married? Because he had to obey all the ordinances to fulfill all righteousness. And according to Jewish law, a rabbi had to be married before he could teach. And we could, we could throw out a lot of things. But quite frankly, I uh, I personally only know of one apostle that taught that specifically, and uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie. So I'm going to go with that's kind of in the low category. Now, you might be able to argue a little higher, but I'm just going to go with that one. How about Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Low. No, just kidding. High, of course. That's an easy one. Jesus was literally conceived by the Father in the natural way. And that's low. Yeah, I only know of one apostle that taught that, and I'm, and I'm sure, uh-oh, I'm sure there's more, but we're just going to go with that, because it just hasn't been taught, it hasn't been repeatedly taught by the prophets and apostles. 
Evolution as an explanation for the origin of man is definitely false. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I, that one. So let's go with another one. There was there was no death at all on the earth before the fall. Well, um, your natural inclination is to say that's false. Um, and, and especially since the Bible dictionary says that uh, Latter-day Revelation teaches that there was no death on this earth before the fall. Death entered the world as a direct result of the fall. Mary and G. Romney said there was no death in the world before Adam. However, Elder James E. Talmadge, Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, when he was an apostle, he said there was death before the fall. So that's in uh, Earth and Man. It was in the Deseret News in 1931, uh, November 31st. So, uh, yeah, that's, so, I'm going to say that one's low. Um, even though I kind of list towards there was death towards before the fall, but I'm just going to have to go with that. Somewhere between low and, and semi up in there. Uh, God will forgive us as we truly repent of our sins. Oh, that's an easy one. Jesus was definitely born on April 6th. Oh, that's an easy one. No, it's not. <laughs> a lot of people think that, but, uh, you know, J. Reuben Clark and, and a few other apostles and prophets said, no, I think he was born in December. And there is some really interesting research right now. I have an interesting paper on it showing the lunar calendar and the eclipses that were recorded <clears throat> in Josephus. Now now we, we kind of get an idea that uh, yeah, there's a good idea that Jesus was actually born uh, in December and, and the date that we have is actually incorrect. At least what's incorrect is what is said in, in uh, James E. Talmadge's book. So there's no possibility of progression between kingdoms of glory. Now, I've always taught that for 26 years of teaching. I've always taught that you cannot progress. And then I read that quote by Hiram Smith uh, just recently, uh, this year, that he said he believed there was. J. Reuben Clark believed there, that there could be some progression. And the same with Brigham Young. Well, that was in your pre-class reading. So now I'm like, I'm still up there around the high. I'll go with low, but I, I'm somewhere in the middle now. Uh, so... Yeah, Jesus was resurrected. Uh, we will too. Uh, easy, high, high. Yeah, salvation comes to Christ. Oh, easy, high, high confidence. So that's how we determine doctrine. So boom, that's, you just think of that model I just showed you, the level of confidence, okay? Just remember that. So some things you're like, well, there's a high probability or there's a high level of confidence, whatever word, word you want to use. But it's a great model to, and use your lens to determine is it, low, semi, or high. Now, what if, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, church history. So what is reliable history? Well, look on the left there. We've got History of the Church by Joseph Smith, and we got History of the Saints by John C. Bennett. Which one's more reliable? Well, John C. Bennett was an enemy to the church, so I don't know if I trust that one. Let's go over to the right side, and we've got Mormon Guy, Mormon History Guy podcast, or we got the Institute Manual that went through church correlation. Which one would you trust? Which one's more reliable? Well, you want to go, of course, it's pretty obvious. Well, I, I'm going to, so I want, want you to choose one of the, this multiple choice question, uh, one of these answers. So what are the best sources for finding reliable history? What would you say? What's your, just look at it, prophets, a guy with a blog, trained historians, or your smart uncle? Which one would you go with? Yeah, you're leaning. You're looking at prophets and apostles. I know you are. I can see you right through my screen. Yeah, uh, that's a temptation to say, yeah, that's the one. But um, uh, M. Russell Ballard said, you know, sometimes they want to defer to the apostles for all knowledge, including historical issues. And he explains that this is not really wise. As we begin uh, to, to consider that, some of your questions, it's important to remember I am a general authority but that doesn't make me an authority in general. <laughs> I worry sometimes that members expect too much from church leaders and teachers, expecting them to be experts in subjects well beyond their duties and responsibilities. The Lord called the apostles and prophets to invite others to come unto Christ, not to obtain advanced degrees in ancient history biblical studies, and other fields that may be useful in answering all the questions we may have 
about Scripture's history and about the church. If you have a question that requires an expert, please take the time to find a thoughtful, qualified expert to help you. There are many on this campus and elsewhere who have the degrees and expertise to respond and give some insight to most of these types of questions. There, so if you have a question that requires an expert, again, he says, please take time to find a thoughtful and qualified expert to help you. So if we're looking for an expert to help us to understand church history, what are our best sources for finding reliable history? And uh, I want to say trained historians. And the church has trained historians in Salt Lake City, uh, near the church office building. And so I wanted, So one of the questions I asked you, what are the five questions trained historians ask to determine reliable history? Well, uh, first of all, how close is it to the source? Is it a firsthand, an eyewitness experience, or is it a secondhand where they heard it from the eyewitnesses? or the third hand, they heard it from the guy who heard it from the eyewitnesses, or the fourth hand, they heard it from the guy who heard it from the guy who heard it from the eyewitness, or fifth hand, there's cousins, friend, co-workers said, aunt said she heard it from a guy that this is what happened. So, uh, so how close is it to the source? What do you mean all my facts are wrong? I copied everything straight off the internet. Mm. Okay, so two, how much time went by before they recorded it? Um, was it 70 years ago or was it just last week that they wrote it down? Which one's going to be more accurate? If it's a contemporary account recorded, you know, relatively near the time, that's like a blue ribbon, uh, account. Uh, if it's later reminiscing, eh, the more time that passes, uh, the less we can depend on it. But if it's a first person account, is, there's still a lot of validity there. So what, are, what is the motive of the one telling the account? Why did he or she tell the story? Did it have an agenda, an ulterior motive, an ax to grind? Like John C. Bennett's History of the Saints, he had an ax to grind. He was an enemy to the church, and he wanted to undermine and, and destroy it. Who are they writing to? What's the audience? Is it a neutral tone, balanced, candid, open? So how opinionated is it? And beware of historical spin. Uh, spin is a kind of a propaganda. It's chief to knowingly providing a biased interpretation of event to kind of persuade public opinion. So it's kind of like just showing part of the picture, like in this coffee cup model right here. You see what they want you to see. You know, people might write because they want, you know, maybe they want to just show the positive in something. In, in a historical account. They don't want to show what really happened because it might make the person look bad. And so, you know, that's, that's partially accurate, but not completely accurate. Let me give me an example. So, Remus Starr. On the back of this photo, it says, Remus Starr, horse thief, sent to Montana, territorial prison, 1885. Escaped, 1887, robbed the Montana Flyer six times. I think that's a train. Caught by Pinkerton detectives, convicted and hanged 1889. Now, listen to what his descendants wrote about him. Remus Starr was a famous cowboy in Montana Territory. His business empire grew to include the acquisition of valuable equestrian assets and included intimate dealings with the Montana Railroad. Beginning in 1885, he devoted several years of his life to service at a government facility finally taking a key role in a vital investigation to run by the renowned Pinkerton Detective Agency. In 1889, Remus passed away during an important civic fun function held in his honor on the platform upon which he was standing, collapsed. So, all right, so that, how does it compare this to other sources? That's another thing we got to look at when we look at historical documents. Compare and contrast the account with primary and secondary sources dealing with the same event. Are they dates, facts, claims? Are they consistent with the other sources? Are they major differences? So boom, 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 boom. That's what we got. That's what helps us uh, determine our overall reliability. So let's practice. Practice makes perfect, right? We're going to skip this example. 
my throat's really starting to hurt and it is now 11 10 p.m so i'm gonna end right here but i just want to show this give this example so this is charles walker and he wrote in his journal in 1893 he said attended fast meeting brother john alger said while speaking of the prophet joseph smith that when he john was a small boy he heard the prophet joseph relate his vision of seeing the father and the son that God touched his eyes with his finger and said, Joseph, this is my beloved son, hear him. And as soon as the Lord touched his eyes with his finger, he immediately saw the Savior. So Charles Walker, hearing John tell the story, he's a first person witness. So Charles is hearing John Alger tell the story. And John Alger is, was a first person witness standing there with the prophet Joseph Smith. So we've got a first count, a uh, first hand story by the boy who's now an old man and we got a second account second hand account charles walker hearing him tell the story so is this reliable well, he even says after the meeting a few of us questioned him meaning john alger about the matter and, and he told us at the bottom of the meeting house steps that he was in the house of father smith in kirtland and when joseph had made this declaration that joseph while speaking of it put his finger to his right eye suiting the action with the words so as to illustrate and at the time impress the occurrence on minds of those into whom he was speaking. We enjoyed the conversation very much. So can we count it? How close was it? How much? Well, boom, boom. Is it reliable? Does it hit the bull? Does it hit the, hit the mark? Well, Charles Walker, again, he's a third hand uh, storyteller. Uh, John Alger, uh, look at him. He's 73 years old at the time. He's born in 1820. I said that, and by the way, I said Charles was second hand, but he's actually the third hand because Joseph is the first hand. John Alger is the second hand and uh, Charles on the left there is third hand. Now, John is 73 years old when he's telling this story about Joseph. Uh, he's born in 18, 1812. So that's 60 years later. So... How close to the source? How much time has passed? 60 years. So you see, our, how reliable can we be? What was his motive? I think it was, I think he told the story to build faith. And it seems factual. Nah, there's no, uh, nothing to corroborate the source. And nothing to triangulate those sources. So um, can we trust that story? Yeah. remember our, our confidence uh, meter where is it is it low is it semi or is it high and you know and i'm gonna have to go with well I, it's not high not not real reliable but i don't know if it's low it's somewhere in between and uh you know some of these you know that it's not it's not pertinent to our salvation to know <clears throat> things like was jesus married did Heavenly Father touch Joseph Smith's eyes to open his, uh, his, his spiritual mind so he could see Jesus? You know, it doesn't really matter, does it? But what matters is that Jesus is the Christ and that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. And those things, and that the Book of Mormon's been translated and that President Nelson's a prophet and that this is, those are the kinds of things that really matter. But when we come across those things, there's still things that maybe they don't matter, but they still we want to know, is it true? Is this doctrine? Is it a principle? Uh, is it someone's opinion? And I hope that from here on out, you now have a way to, to judge and determine for yourself. And we're going to, we're going to look at a lot of the, a lot of the uh, things that the critics have thrown against, against our church and against our members. And we'll look at doctrines. We'll look at uh, historical events. And you get to determine, determine yourself, now that you've got the lens, now that you've got the, the, uh, the tools in, the, in your nail pouch, you can now start to, to build and to know, build your own testimony, strengthen your testimony. So I want you to know that I know that Jesus Christ is our, our Savior. And I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. I know that. And I know the Book of Mormon. It is the word of God. And I know the Heavenly Father knows you and he loves you. And I say it in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.